that can. Will we start her without her? Good evening, ladies and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Barbados Museum and to the joint presentation of the history and genealogy groups. Um, we're very, very pleased to have this collaboration this evening on a subject that is both interesting to historians as well as persons who have a narrower interest in genealogy, and we're very, very happy to have a, merge of the, a merger of the two groups this evening. Um, I am Kay Hall, I'm the Museum's Education and Community Outreach Officer. And before we get into the main presentation this evening, we're gonna have a short talk uh, by Ms. Pat Gage. Um, she is a member of the genealogy group, as well as a member of the Society of Genealogists, and she recently attended the Roots Tech International Genealogy Conference, and she's going to just provide a quick update to the groups about that before we go into our main presentation this evening. Thank you. Welcome, Pat. Good evening. For those of you who do not know me, I live in the United Kingdom near London and I visit Barbados twice a year, staying with our very good friends Humphrey and Jilly Metzgen, who I'm sure you, many of you know. As a keen, intermittent amateur genealogist, I had heard about the, the annual three-day conference in Salt Lake City, organised by Family Search International the not-for-profit organisation sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm not a member of the church, but have used resources from Family Search over the years. I would never have dreamt of attending, but this year, for the first time ever, the conference was also held in London at the Excel Centre. Social media messages requested volunteers to assist at the conference. I applied and was selected. This meant I could attend for free in return for working from 8.30 till 1.30 each of the days. There were around 2,000 delegates, all keen family researchers with varying levels of experience. Each day had a keynote session and many different workshops on various topics. There were over 150 different workshops. I brought copies of the conference programme so that if anybody does want to look and have more detail about that, they're available later in the evening. In the main exhibition hall, there were stalls from a wide range of genealogy-related agencies, including family history societies, companies selling DNA testing kits, and genealogy software with specialist support services where there were experts to assist individuals with their own research. 
One stand had a new company developing a genealogy program with maps linking census information on individuals to their location at the time. I had long thought that this was a gap in the available software programs and that it would be very useful. I'm not a geographer, a detested school subject at which I failed miserably. <laughs> But through family history, I now have a much better idea of place and location and the economy of particular areas. The keynote speech on the first day was introduced by Nick Barrett, who directed the Who Do You Think You Are series of TV programmes, which has now been copied in many other countries where celebrities are assisted to find out more about their ancestors and background. His work has inspired many who would never have looked into their ancestry to begin this addictive activity. One of the celebrities who had been part of the programme, a TV historian, Dan Snow, spoke about his own journey into his past. His direct ancestor was a senior general in the First World War, 1914 to 18. He was given access to records of the huge loss of life of British and other troops on the battlefields of the Somme, including meeting and talking with a descendant of one of the soldiers killed in the conflict. He also had access to family letters written by the general, his ancestor, at the time to his wife back in England from his safe offices well behind the front line. He was sending thousands to their deaths due to incompetent planning and limited supplies. He and the other senior officers failed to learn from their mistakes. The conditions for the troops were appalling and the losses belonged all previous experience. At the same time, he was writing to his wife about how well everything was progressing. Fortunately, he eventually realised that the task was too great for him and retired. However, he then compounded his incompetence by trying to lay the blame for defeats on the brave soldiers, claiming that they did not have the necessary fighting spirit. Dan Snow found it very difficult to come to terms with the actions of his ancestors and reflected on how far each individual should shoulder guilt for the actions of those who came before us. And I think this theme has relevance in other situations too. I will finish by briefly mentioning one of the workshops I was able to attend, entitled Tracing Your Windrush Roots. The speaker was Adrian Stone, a descendant of Caribbean emigres to the UK whose company Own History specialises in assisting anyone with a Caribbean heritage to research and link up the various strands of their personal history. He started like many of us by realising when his mother was elderly and ill how little he knew of his own family background. Having begun to research himself, he now has links to 6,000 relatives across three continents. The conference inspired me to return to my own researches and to write up the stories and links for my children and their children in a more cohesive and accessible way. It is hoped that the conference will be repeated in future years outside Salt Lake City and I would strongly recommend it to anyone able to attend.
Thank you, Pat. You had mentioned some time ago that you were going to bring some leaflets. So you do have some material. Okay, thank you. And I think um, we will all try to aspire to attend Route Step 2020. I think it's quite early in the year, next year, February, I think it is. Yeah. So thanks again. Okay, this evening we are getting to the meat of the matter, so to speak. We have Dr. Sharon Marshall, who will be presenting <coughs> to us this evening. And she'll be looking at solving the mystery of major peoples, a virtual journey to islands and continents. Uh, a lot of us know major peoples only as the benefactor for the King George V Memorial Park. But I think um, this evening we will come away knowing so much more about him. Uh, Sharon, there is a bio on Sharon in the leaflet, so I wouldn't want to repeat this. You can read it for yourself. What I can tell you is that Sharon is a member of a genealogy group. Uh, she's a member of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. For those of you who do not know uh, the group, the group has been in existence since 2014. And Sharon is a, a very active member of the group. Um, she will say that um, she did not do history at um, CXC, but she has a love for history and for research. And in fact, she has, was able to redeem herself by the publication of her book, Tell My Mother I Gone to Cuba. Um, and if you all haven't read that book, I think there's still some copies available in the shop. So you can give yourselves a, an early Christmas gift. So this evening, Sharon continues to redeem herself by not only the publication of the book, but by researching um, these little known aspects of Barbadian and Caribbean history. So we look forward to hearing a bit more about Major Peebles. Major Peebles, solving the mystery of Major Peebles, a virtual journey to islands and continents. Sharon? What do you mean? Thank you, Harriet. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin by thanking the Barbados Genealogy Group and the History Group for the opportunity of making this presentation. I also thank the weather for cooperating, the Barbados Light and Power Company for allowing me <laughs> to make the presentation this evening. At the outset, allow me to make a disclaimer. This is not a scholarly presentation. So those of you who are disappointed and wish to leave, please see Harriet for a full refund. <laughs> I'm simply sharing my virtual journey to solve the mystery that Major Peebles was to me. This information will be presented mostly in a linear fashion but that belies the various twists and turns that took place as I tried to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. It's been a fascinating journey and one on which I learned a great deal. I also had a lot of fun. I hope that you'll find it as interesting and intriguing as I did. So, meeting Major Peebles. I first came across the name Major Peebles while conducting research for a forthcoming book. This name was mentioned in the House of Assembly debates in the context of efforts to establish the King George V Memorial Park. Peebles, I thought, funny name. I'd never heard of it before. After the park had been officially opened on the 24th of May, 1936, the Barbados Herald Weekly published an article about it the following Saturday, which stated in part, 
I want to send my warmest thanks and appreciation to Major Peebles for the splendid effort he has made to give the people of St. Philip a park. The conception is undoubtedly a fine one, and the way he has set about it is beyond all praise. King George V Memorial Park was the first such park in the entire British Empire, honoring the late King George, and others in the empire were modeled after it. So Barbados was first in something. And uh, Major Peebles, the first mention was just Major Peebles. It wasn't central to my research, so I just wrote in my manuscript that the, the committee was chaired by a Major Peebles. It appeared that everyone knew who he was or that people should know. Then I found subsequent references to Major H. Peebles. It seems that back then everyone was referred to by their initials because then I discovered Major H. W. Peebles. And I was intrigued, wondering what the H.W. stood for. But then I learned that he had been administrator of St. Vincent. So after doing a Google search for administrators of St. Vincent, I discovered that, in fact, he was Herbert Walter Peebles. So that's what the H.W. stood for. And that was the open sesame to a treasure trove of civil records on sites like familysearch.org and ancestry.com. I would have been ahead of the game if I had done like Harriet and gone to King George V Memorial Park <laughs> <laughs> and seen this plaque, which indicated that it was in memory of the late Major H.W. Peebles, CMG, DSO, OB, who for the welfare of youth in this island established this King George V Memorial Park. It was opened by His Excellency, the Governor Sir Mark Young, 24th May, 1936. And the plaque was unveiled by His Excellency, the Governor Sir John Stowe, on the 8th of November, 1963. But it was when I came across this, oh, that, in the Daily Gleaner, from Jamaica, it, it indicated that Major Peebles gives his views and observations regarding a variety of economic and social problems. He was one of the people who testified during the Royal Commission, which was instituted after the 1937 riot. So I was like really impressed. Hmm. So Major Peebles gave testimony at the Moyne Commission. I was hooked. I had to find out more. I still have not located a record with his precise date of birth, but I know that it was sometime in December 19, um, 1877. He was born in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire, England. But some of the records indicate his birth date as 1878 because that was the year in which his birth was actually registered in the first quarter of 1878. The baptismal records indicate that he was baptized at All Saints Church on the 31st of March, 1878. And he appears as a three-year-old in the 1881 England and Wales census, along with other members of his father's household. You see his father, Thomas, age 63 at the time. Then there's a son, Alan Lang, another son, Evelyn Chiappini, the daughter, Florence Mary, Alice Maud, another daughter, a son, Arthur Stansfield, a daughter, Emily, Edith, and Herbert Walter at three years old. But where's the mother, I'm asking myself, where's his mother? See, she had borne Thomas seven children, some one or two years apart, from Cape Town to London, to Grahamstown in the Cape, back to Cape Town, Bath in Somerset, and the last two in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. I would later discover that Elizabeth Maria Henrietta Peebles, née Chiappini, was born in South Africa, 2nd of April, 1839. She got married to Thomas on the 30th of October, 1862, and died on the 1st of March, 
1879 in Cheltenham. This was the 1st of March, 1879, when Herbert Walter was just two years old. So that's why she was not in the household during the, the census. Elizabeth Peebles was just 39 years old at the time of her death, which occurred one month before her 40th birthday. She was 23 years younger than her husband. Now, in the absence of the mother, there were a number of females engaged in the care of the household. And Thomas brought his niece, Emily, from Ireland. There was a cook, Sarah King, a parlor maid, Sarah Aston, a nurse, Sarah Wayne, and another nurse, Maria Bayless. These were all living at Sunnyside at the time of the 1881 census. By the time of the 1891 census, 10 years later, the household at Sunnyside had been greatly reduced. Only four of his children were living at home with Thomas. Florence Mary, Alice Maud, Arthur Stansfield, and Emily Edith. And Herbert Walter wasn't captured at home because he was away at school in Devon at the Newton College in Woolborough. By 1895, he was on a register of persons who applied for a passport to travel even though, according to the United Kingdom National Archives, before the First World War, it was not compulsory for someone traveling abroad to apply for a passport. Possession of a passport was confined largely to merchants and diplomats, and the vast majority of those traveling overseas had no formal documents. But have passport will travel. In 1898, Herbert Walter traveled to Canada and he remained there for one year. The records indicate that a Mr. H. Peebles arrived in Montreal from Liverpool on the SS Labrador on the 7th of November, 1898. The Boer War or the South African War was the first time that Canadian troops were sent overseas for combat duty. 7,300 Canadian troops and 12 nurses served in South Africa. Herbert Walter Peebles was among them. He enlisted December 1899 in the Canadian Mounted Rifles in Edmonton. And the, Gloucestersh the Gloucestershire Cheltenham Boer War Memorial gives us some vital statistics about Herbert Walter at the time of his enlistment. We are told that he was moved at age 22, that he was 155 pounds, that he was of fair complexion, he had blue eyes, brown hair, he was 5 feet 11 and a half inches, and his girth was 35 and a half inches. His religion was Church of England. He was born in Cheltenham. He was a rancher by trade. He was the son of Colonel T. Peebles of Cheltenham, and he was a single man. On the 13th of September 1900, he was discharged from the Canadian Mounted Rifles for a commission in the British Army. And he fought in South Africa in the Boer War and was severely wounded in his right arm. For his service, he was awarded the Queen's Medal with four clasps, which was given to people who saw action in South Africa between October and May, October 1899 and May 1902. As a result of his service in South Africa, he also received the King's Clasp the King's Medal with two class, which was awarded to troops who served between January 1902 and June 1902. There were other rewards for the young officer, as we are told in this newspaper extract. Herbert W. Peebles, the youngest son of Colonel Peebles, 
accompanied the Canadian battery on Lord Roberts's march, which ended in the capture of Bloemfontein, and was the only one of the gun section left standing when the capital was reached. He was afterwards rewarded for his services with a commission in the Army Service Corps, in which capacity he was especially selected as supply officer to move with Lord Kitchener. So he was in big company. For Lieutenant Peebles, the theater of war moved, and the slide should move to, yes, to from South Africa to East Africa, where he served in Somaliland. He saw action at Jigbali, and he was aide de camp to Lieutenant Colonel W.H. Manning, who thought very highly of him. He thought he was a very smart young officer, according to the London Gazette. And the promise which Lieutenant Colonel Manning saw in young peoples blossomed as he made his way through the ranks of the British Army, going almost to the top. Click. So there were only three ranks that, that he didn't reach. But a number of other people's men also chose life in the army. His brother Evelyn became a brigadier general. Of course, his father Thomas was a colonel. His grandfather was a lieutenant colonel, also Thomas. His brother, Arthur Stansfield, became a lieutenant colonel as well. And Arthur Stansfield's son became a major, Major Alan Charles Chiapini Peebles. Major Herbert Walker, Walter rather, and his brother, Alan Lang Peebles, became a captain, and his son, John Alan Lang Peebles, also became a captain. Evelyn Chiapini served in the South African War in 1900. He was also severely wounded and received the, the Queen's Medal with two clasps and was created a, compa a companion of the Distinguished Service Order. The insignia were presented by the king on the 29th of October, 1901. Evelyn served in the European War from 1914 in command of the 2nd Norfolk Regiment. And he also commanded an infantry brigade in the Indian Expeditionary Force from January 1916 to July 1917. And in Ju on July 25th, he commanded a brigade in India. Herbert Walter, he was created a, a CB, Commander of the Bath, in 1916 and a CMG in 1917 for his service. The brother, Captain Alan, whoop, Captain Alan Lang Peebles, died at the age of 31 during the famous Chitral expedition in what was then British India. It was a military expedition that was sent by the authorities to relieve the fort at Chitral, which had been under siege following a local coup. The intervening British force of about 400 men was besieged in the fort for a month and a half until it was relieved by two expeditions. And the siege cost the defenders 41 lives, including that of Alan Lang Peebles. Major Peebles loved to travel. You couldn't keep him off a ship. One of the places he traveled to was Nigeria. And we see on the 18th of November, 1905, he went from Liverpool to Forcados, Nigeria. In 1907, he was back in Liverpool from Nigeria. Uh huh. And uh, January, then April again. I don't have the outward journey, but he was back in Liverpool the 29th of April, 1907, from Nigeria. And uh, on September 11th, 1909, he left Liverpool for Nigeria. And 1909, he joined the Northern. The, the Royal Society's Club as a member of the African Society's 
Club, and he also joined the United Grand Lodge of England Freemasons, Northern Nigeria Lodge in Zungaru, and he gave his occupation as a civil servant. Zungaru, I, I knew nothing about it, so I had to find out that it was a town in Niger State, Northern Nigeria, which was the capital of the British colony of Northern Nigeria from 1902 until 1916. The British forces occupied Zangaru September 1902 and cleared the forests in the area. They established a market, military bar barracks, and a hospital, among other things. Then in 1914, the colonies of Northern and Southern Nigeria were amalgamated into one colonial entity, and the North's capital was moved to Kaduna in 1916. Canada rewarded the Boer War veterans. Under the Volunteer Bounty Act of 1908, veterans of the war were entitled to 320 acres of Dominion land. But most veterans opted to receive scrip in the amount of $160 rather than a land grant, or they sold their land grant entitlement to a substitute. When Click up. Yes. When Herbert Walter applied for his grant in 1909, he gave his occupation as assistant resident, Northern Nigeria, West Africa, and he opted for the script. He indicated that his service with the Canadian Mounted Rifles and the British Armed Forces in South Africa ran from February 1900 to November 1901. On the 20th of November, 1910, he married Gwendolyn Bertha Davies in Brimbo, Denbyshire, Wales. And on the 13th of January, the following year, they traveled to Canada, arriving in Halifax, Nova Scotia on the Hesperian from Liverpool, England. And you can see that he was recorded as a returning Canadian who had spent one year in Alberta, the part that's, that's highlighted there. But they gave their intended address as Walhachin, British Columbia. Hmm, Walhachin had never heard of it, so I had to find out. And I discovered that this clicker doesn't work very well. <laughs> Yes, Walhachin was a, a planned development which began in 1908, and in 1909 it was named Walhachin. And from 1909 to 1914 was considered its heyday, and it was regarded as an affluent colony of English settlers and was often termed Canada's Camelot. Walhachin boasted luxurious amenities that were nearly unheard of in other towns of that era. For example, many of the townspeople were said to live in fine stone homes with high ceilings and large fireplaces, and they had servants, maids, and valets. The town could boast of a Chinese laundry, a polo field, a swimming pool, a skating rink, and tennis courts. But the onset of the First World War caused many of the British residents to return home to fight for their country, and the last resident of Walhachin left in 1922, and it's described as a ghost town. In the 1911 Canada Census, Peebles and, Peebles and his wife Gwendolyn are recorded. Even though the census taker misspelled their names, it's pretty clear that it's them. They were residing at Yale and Caribou sub-districts in British Columbia, and they gave their immigration year as 1911. Also recorded at the Peebles household was domestic help, which had come over from Wales, George and Anne Jones, and presumably their son, Hugh. On September 30th, 1912, Captain Herbert Walter and Gwen arrived in Liverpool, England, from Montreal, Quebec, on board the SS Canada. Now, I don't know if this is when they left Canada for good. I haven't found the record of when he first arrived in Dominica to lead the police force, but 
One source, Elsa Pascal, indicated that he was someone with Dominican connections who served during the war. He was soon promoted to, he was the leader of the, the Dominican Defense Force. He was soon promoted to major, but permission to recruit troops from the Leeward Islands was denied him. But dozens of Englishmen from Dominica financed their own way to England to enlist in the war. According to Pascal, he reportedly served at the British Army headquarters at Aldershot in southeast England. However, there's evidence that he also saw action in the European theater. He was awarded the 1914 Star Medal, which was conferred for service in France and Belgium between the 5th of August 1922 and November 1914. Peebles applied for his medal in 1919, and it was sent to the office of the governor of Antigua and the Leeward Islands and on to the commissioner's office in Tortola, Virgin Islands, and not Virgin Ireland, <laughs> as indicated there. But here's one mystery that I haven't been able to solve. In June 1919, Herbert Walter, then 41, and Gwendolyn arrived in Halifax with their son, three-year-old Alan Lang, on the Adriatic from England en route to Trinidad, British West Indies. And you can see indicated here in the column at the far right, which lists if the passenger had previously been to Canada, it was first a yes, which was then converted to a no. So why? When we know from previous records that from 1898 he had spent a year in Canada, had listed, enlisted in the Canadian Mounted Rifles, and was listed on the 1911 Canada Census as residing in British Columbia. That is a mystery to me. If anybody has any ideas, please share why he would, would do that. From life as a rancher in Canada, a soldier in South Africa and East Africa, and a civil servant in British Honduras and Nigeria, Peebles came to the West Indies as a colonial civil servant. From 1919 to 1922, he was administrator of the British Virgin Islands. From 22 to 29, commissioner of Montserrat. From 11th November 27th to 10th April 28, he was acting administrator of Dominica. And 1929 to 1933, administrator of St. Vincent. As a good British colonial civil servant in the West Indies, Major Peebles defended the interests of the empire. This reference in Selwyn Kajo's book, Caribbean Visionary, highlights one intervention Peebles made at the time of great labor agitation and the quest for self-government in the region. It relates to a visit by the Trinidadian labor leader, Captain Arthur Cipriani, to Grenada. Major Peebles, acting administrator of St. Vincent, took upon himself to write the governor of Grenada urging that Captain Cipriani should not be allowed to set foot in Grenada and that in the event of the advice not being taken, it should at least be made obligatory on Cipriani to submit in categorical form to the governor of Grenada an outline of the several points on which it was his purpose to address the inhabitants of the island. So Major Peebles was defending the interests of the empire. Did I mention that Major Peebles loves to travel? Yes. During his civil service career in the West Indies, he traveled often between the region and the mother country. For example, 30th of May, 1927, he arrived in Bristol from Trinidad. 31st of July, 1927, he left Avonmouth for Bridgetown. July 30th, he was back in England from Grenada. And uh, he also traveled from London to St. Vincent in 1930. His regional travel was captured in an item in the Daily Gleaner of the 29th of November, 1932. 
His Honor, Major H.W. Peebles, Administrator of St. Vincent, left on Monday, November 14th for Barbados on short leave of absence. During Major Peebles' absence, the government is being administered by the Honorable J.H. Otway, the Colonial Treasurer. So, Major Peebles, his movements were monitored, <laughs> noted in the press. For his service, he was the recipient of a number of honors. These included the Distinguished Service Order, which was conferred in 1917 after his retirement from the Army. He was also awarded an OBE in 1925 while he was Commissioner of Montserrat. And while he served as Administrator of St. Vincent, he was made a Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in 1933. These honors recognize the life of service which Major Peebles lived. The British West Indies was the beneficiary of this service in several ways, and some manifestations of the contribution of Major Peebles still remain to this day. These include Peebles Hospital in the British Virgin Islands. A history of the hospital states that Commissioner Peebles raised some of the necessary funds by public subscription and even approached estate managers in Cuba and Santo Domingo for assistance on grounds that some of the diseases requiring hospitalization were picked up by laborers in these islands. So this was the Cottage Hospital. And Norwell Harrigan and Pearl Varlock write in their book, The Virgin Islands Story, that there was no public health institution there prior to 1922 when he opened the, he opened the hospital. To complicate the health situation, there was only one doctor for all the islands, and his visit to the outlying districts on Tortola had to be made on horseback over steep and rugged hillsides. The trips to the out islands were most infrequent, the return journey taking the better part of a day to complete. In her book, nurse Norma Benjamin wrote on nursing in the Virgin Islands, a historical perspective, and she shares some interesting information about Major Peebles, who arrived in the islands as commissioner just 12 months after the end of World War I. She said, he came filled with energy and ideas. He had the interest, the necessary will and determination to improve the challenging situation in the Virgin Islands. Records indicate that among other things, he provided the Virgin Islands with its first motor launch service to St. Thomas, improved record keeping, made education compulsory, and organized local horse racing. Nurse Benjamin notes that as commissioner, he was very involved as he served in many capacities, including magistrate, treasurer, coroner, and receiver of wrecks, etc. In 1922, on completion of the hospital, Major Peebles went to England on leave and collected a large quantity of supplies that included used army clothing, army saddles, and many other things. And when he returned to the Virgin Islands, he held a large fair at the experiment station, and this yielded a great amount of money from which he bought furnishings for the cottage hospital. While he was commissioner in Montserrat, Major Peebles initiated a project to bring piped water to almost every district in the island. And from the same source, we learn that in 1928, because of his personal intervention, he tried to mitigate the potential damage from a major storm which was approaching Montserrat. Word came from Washington that a storm of considerable intensity was fast approaching. Signals were sounded from St. George's Hills, and Commissioner Peebles personally visited most districts, urging people to bar up and batten down. The influence is also felt in Dominica. In architecture and Caribbean open spaces, they speak about Captain Peebles, chief of police, and at times acting administrator, aimed at developing a small part for the establishment of a monument as a memorial to those who had died in the First World War. As a result, Captain Peebles contributed to the design of the urban city with the inclusion of a space for recreation.
Peebles apparently spent some time in Trinidad and Tobago between his retirement as administrator of St. Vincent in 1933 and his relocation to Barbados in 1935. I have no information on what he did there, but given the nature of the man, I'm sure that he wasn't idle. He wasn't loitering at the beach. When he traveled from England to Trinidad in 1934, he seemed a bit at loose ends though, as he gave his profession or calling as none. On later trips in 1934 and 35, he seemed to get his groove back, adjusting his status to retired army and retired civil service. So, October 34, he went to England. The following month, he left England for Tenerife, Canary Islands, and his professional calling was retired army. In 35, he arrived in London from Tenerife, and professional calling was retired civil service, and he gave his country of last permanent residence as Trinidad. At the end of his colonial civil service career, when Major Peebles retired to Barbados, he was struck by the complete lack of recreational facilities for the country people. And the story of a park, an article in the Daily News of Barbados in 1964 said, Major Peebles felt that in creating such a park and playing field, not only would it be a suitable memorial to King George V, whose interest in youth was profound, but it would fill an enormous need. Major Peebles set himself to this task in the face of what appeared to be insurmountable difficulty. So Major Peebles put his all into establishing the park and keeping it operational. And some of this struggle is captured in that same Daily News article. It was much more than a park and play field, though. Major Peebles raised funds to acquire the 13 acres of land and to buy play park equipment. The article says the task of raising the money to pay for all these things was incredibly hard work, but Major Peebles never flagged for one moment. He felt that a hall was essential to the success of the park, so in 1938, he borrowed money and himself supervised the erection of the present hall. Then he opened a bar in the hall and worked in the bar. He felt that this would be a benefit to the people and a profit to the park. Both hopes proved very true. Then early in 1939, he managed to get water turned into the park. He appreciated the difficulties and dangers of idleness for boys just leaving school. So boys were selected and given a plot each which they cultivated and then they sold their produce. He also had a monthly clothing league where about 60 or 70 children received clothes each month. The Bridgetown firms gave a big reduction on the material purchased and the garments were made by several ladies in the parish. So lots of people were benefiting from, from this. And at Christmas, 500 of the poorest children in the parish were invited to the park. All of the children received a present of toys, cakes, sweets, ices, fruit, and buns. The Daily, the Daily News said it gave enormous happiness. Can imagine. The same article states that the bar was run under the close supervision of Major Peebles and was only closed when, during the war, Major Peebles was away so much that he could not supervise it. I have no information on what that travel entailed, but the park was not the extent of his contribution to Barbados. After World War II, Major Peebles worked tirelessly to assist soldiers who had been demobilized and returned to Barbados. A rehabilitation committee was set up in July 1945 to assist demobilized soldiers. And uh, the chairmanship of this committee was at first undertaken by the Honorable J.H. Wilkinson and later by Major Peebles. Governor Grattan Bush says, Major Peebles has thrown himself wholeheartedly into his task and much of the success it has so far achieved has been due to his energy and enthusiasm. He appeared to have a genuine regard for Barbadians. During his testimony before the Moyne Commission following the 1937 riots, here's one of the things he said about Barbadians. 
First of all, sir, the Barbadian absolutely loves his own country and is very difficult to move at all. Many of them went abroad in the old days, but all those knew that they were coming back. And they also left their families behind them and sent money to them. And he also gave this robust endorsement of the work ethic of Barbadian laborers. There is no doubt about it. The Barbadian laborer is the most magnificent workman you can get anywhere. Do we agree? I have been an administrative commissioner in the islands and we have had these people and except for the fact that they did not have their women with them, they were, they were absolutely magnificent workers and settled down to work splendidly. Major Peebles was resident in Barbados when his only child, Captain John Allen Lang Peebles, died tragically in 1943. And the Gloucestershire Echo included his obituary the following day. Captain John Allen Lang Peebles the, of the Dorchestershire Regiment, beloved only child of Major H. Peebles of Barbados and Mrs. Peebles, Seven Royal Parade, Cheltenham, and their fiance of Mary Rose Ross Turner, age 26 years old. When the will was probated four months later, the younger Peebles had left his estate of 1,392 pounds, 11 shillings, and truppence to his mother, Gwendolyn. Major Peebles himself died on the 24th of March, 1955, at Bailey's in St. Philip and his remains were interred at the Barbados Military Cemetery at Gravesend. When I saw this epitaph, I was puzzled by the other name on the inscription, Marcella Peebles, who was she? 15 years his junior. Warrant officer retired when field boys at the Barbados Legion confirmed that Marcella was in fact his wife, as I had suspected. But what about Gwendolyn? Wasn't she his wife? This mystery sent me back to search the records. <laughs> yes. He, he, he married Gwendolyn Berta Davies on the 7th of December, 1910. But in 1934, Gwendolyn filed for divorce. And the following year, Herbert Walter married Marcella Gordon Cameron of Sunbury Plantation on the 20th of April, 1935. Warrant Officer Boyce had also supplied the information that about 1905, Herbert Walter had married Nora Muriel Sweet Ascot in British Honduras, had no idea. But their engagement was announced in April, 1905. She died of yellow fever the following month at age 20. So I don't know whether the marriage in fact took place because her gravestone has her name as Sweet Eska, so I don't know. But there is that record on Ancestry.com. And then there was an announcement in the Gloucestershire Echo new newspaper of the 8th of April 1909 that he had been engaged to Violet Muriel Treasure. Now, I don't know if you recall, but he first went to Nigeria in November 1905. So after Nora Muriel died, he went off to Nigeria. When he came back from Nigeria in 1909, I guess he met Violet Muriel. But I had to take out a, I had to take out a, subscription to the British Newspaper Archive to get these records. So of course, I'm gonna show them to you. The engagement is announced between Captain Herbert Walter Peebles, Reserve of Officers, late Army Service Corps, youngest son of the late Colonel T. Peebles, and Violet Muriel, youngest daughter of Henry Hurl Treasure of Masfron near Welshpool. Ah, this is the first one, engagement between Herbert Walter and Nora Muriel Sweet Escott. And at the time, he was private secretary and aide de camp to His Excellency Sir Bickham Sweet Escott, governor and commander in chief of British Honduras. So perhaps that's where he learned how to be a colonial administrator. <laughs> but 
Then there's this article on the engagement to Violet Muriel Treasure, youngest daughter of Henry Hurl Treasure, and it indicated that the wedding will probably take place quietly in London in June. Well, clearly that didn't happen as he married Gwen the following year. But the people's legacy lives on. There's People's Hospital in the British Virgin Islands, People's Park in Dominica. There's a People's Street in Montserrat. There's a People's House at Princess Margaret Secondary School. And of course, King George V Memorial Park in Barbados. Over the past several months, this quest to solve the mystery of Major Peebles has been something of an obsession. So now, from Major Peebles, funny name, I can tell you that his maternal great-grandfather was Antonio Balthazar Melchior Gaspar Ciappini, who came from Florence, Italy, and on the 30th of July, 1807, petitioned the governor of the Cape to remain there and he did. This is where Herbert Walter's mother was born. So this is all thanks to the rich repositories of civil records and newspaper files that exist in online archives. It has been a virtual treasure hunt throughout islands and continents in the vast reaches of the former British Empire. The good major might even have felt that I was stalking him on a recent trip, I visited some of the places where he lived or traveled, London, Southampton, Las Palmas, Tenerife. I hope that I haven't disturbed you too much, Major Peebles. Rest in peace. Yes, my dear. Did you find out anything when you were looking at the Virgin Islands, when, the, when part of the Virgin Islands became America? No, uh, because I, I, I did find records of him arriving in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, but I believe that was due to the transportation that was available at the time. But my focus was on the, the British, yeah, the British. I'm just curious if, if anybody here knows when the Americans got involved in, in Virgin Islands, 1917, or they, they bought it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Karen, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. We know so much about them, and yet we still don't know about them. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. But did it ever occur to you in all of this that he could have been involved in secret service? <laughs> I mean, this endless travel around the English colonies and the English possessions and yeah. the places the English were fighting indicated to me that this man had another completely different occupation to yeah. what he really was doing. Yeah. It's entirely possible. And also to be a coroner. I mean, where did he learn the skills to do autopsies, for God's sake? <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Yes, <laughs> uh, jack of all trades. I have a couple of questions. You, you mentioned Edmonton. What did he do in Edmonton? I missed that. He was a rancher. Because I lived in Edmonton, and that name rang a bell when I first heard about it. Okay. And I'm wondering, where his, you know where his ranch was? No. 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 The other question is, whatever happened to Walhatchen, B.C., with all those splendid buildings? Well, they say it's a, a ghost town. It still is. Evidently, from, from what I've been able to, to gather. And then the other thing is another question. Um, the book that you showed us about the Caribbean visionary, that book was about Cipriani. That was not it, about Peebles. That was no, it was, not about, it was not about Peebles, but he was mentioned in it. I yes, saw the reference. Right, yeah. I wasn't sure who it was about the book. Yeah, yes. it was about Cipriani. And one more question. He lived at Bailey's in St. Yes. How long did he live at Bailey's? Was it Bailey's plantation house? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Ah, very interesting. Yes, <laughs> that's where he died. The plot thickens more and more. <laughs> Thank you. We have one comment from online. This is being shared with by Rodney B. He wanted to let you know, he says thanks, and also excellent presentation. He wanted his story to be found and told. Great use of the online reference from Family Search, Ancestry, and the UK newspapers. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Marshall, um, Peter Simpson, um, I have heard that when the park was being um, commissioned, that two plaques were ordered for the gates. Mm -hmm. They arrived in Barbados, and I understood that they were stored at some plantation, possibly mm -hmm. um, by the Sunbury or the Bays, mm -hmm. and they've never been found or located since. Whoa, another mystery. Another mystery. <laughs> yeah. That's not a heard of the water was so. Yes, that's fascinating. I, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and we've been searching for those plaques ever since. Yeah. Somebody knows where they are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well I don't think they knew what they were, you see. Okay. I have no idea what they were coming, you know, what they look like. Yeah. Anyhow, thank you. You're welcome. Barbados Museum and Historical Society. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Marshall for sharing you. your research with us this evening. Um, and also to Dr. Marshall, Linda Lewis, and Richard Odell for the refreshments tonight. And to all of you for coming and participating in tonight's joint group. Okay, I'd like to now invite you guys to have some refreshments at the back. Another round of applause for Dr. Marshall. Thank you. <laughs>